Welcome to part three of the solar system discussion uh, for the Earth Science class. This is part three and the last part uh, to this uh, discussion. So in part one, uh, we talked about the evolution of the solar system with respect to the knowledge and talked about the uh, what I like to call the big guns uh, that contributed to what we know about our solar system today. Uh, so for exam purposes, uh, you folks uh, should be able to go through each one of the folks we talked about and um, uh, describe and identify uh, how they contributed uh, to the knowledge. So you should be familiar with Ptolemy, um, uh, Nicholas Copernicus, Tycho Bray, Johannes Kepler, uh, Galileo, uh, and Newton. I believe those were the folks that we covered. Uh, in part two, we covered the seasons. And we looked at some of the planetary uh, characteristics. I showed you a series of pictures of the planets in part two, where we looked at the um, various kinds of uh, characteristics. So you should be familiarize yourself or should be familiar with or familiarize yourself uh, with um, the common uh, differences between the terrestrial planets and the gaseous planets. And with the seasons, uh, you should understand the geometry of the seasons with respect to the earth uh, being tilted at 23 and a half degrees and being able to identify the uh, different solstices and uh, equinoxes with respect to their proper dates in the proper hemispheres. So part three, uh, we're going to look at moon phases and eclipses. And uh, this first photograph or slide that you see here is uh, a solar eclipse and which is showing you a very uh, uh, momentarily, or I should say a few seconds uh, worth of a total eclipse. So a couple of moon and uh, earth uh, characteristics with respect to how they are related to one another. Uh, in terms of miles, uh, on average, the moon really is, uh, can uh, range between 238,000 to 250,000 miles from the earth which astronomically, that's actually pretty close compared to some of the other distances that we've been referring to uh, throughout this discussion. Um, we look at the diameter of the Earth at about uh, 12,756 miles, compare that to the diameter of the moon, which is about 2,150 miles. And what's unique here is really the moon is just about the quarter size um, of the Earth. And if you were to go on the moon in terms of the gravitational pull, uh, the moon is about one sixth of the Earth's gravity, which means, for example, that if you look at towards the bottom of your screen, you'll see that uh, you take a 220 pound person like myself, and I stand on a scale on the moon, uh, I would actually only be 36 pounds. So if one wants to lose weight real fast, just go to the moon. But the real question is, do you really lose weight? Or I should say, do you really lose mass? And the answer is no, your mass stays the same. So really, what is weight? And weight, uh, from a physics point of view, represents how much gravitational pull, for example, um, is uh, you know pulling down on you, or how much are you accelerating, is basically what it means. So on the Earth, uh, we have a 9.8 meters per second squared acceleration. And so if I'm standing on a scale, it's going to accelerate me as I'm standing on the scale. And that's where I get 220 pounds. In fact, if you go to Jupiter, I would weigh about 800 pounds, uh, which I wouldn't be able to survive on Jupiter because the gravitational pull is so strong. Uh, density wise, um, the moon is about 3.3 grams per cubic centimeter. That's probably a little bit more dense than an aluminum can. And remember the Earth's overall density is about five and a half grams per cubic centimeter. So really when you compare densities, it would be like holding an iron ball in one hand, which would represent the Earth, and then holding an aluminum can in your other hand. And that kind of gives you an idea um, of the density differences between the Earth and the Moon. Now, if you wanted to uh, weigh uh, or know what your weight is on the Moon, take your current weight and just multiply it by 0.16. And uh, that would certainly give you uh, how much you would weigh on the Moon. So 
So if we take a look at the moon's surface, there's a couple um, uh, major types of features uh, that can be found on the moon's uh, surface. And I remember when I was um, a little kid, uh, I would like to look up at the night sky and look at the moon and I would see the dark spots and I would see the lighter areas of the moon. And I always thought when I was a little kid uh, that those dark spots were reflections of the continents from the earth, uh, uh, you know, being reflected on the moon. But then as I got older and more schooled, I soon figured out that the moon is only 25% size of the earth. So to put the continent of Africa on there would cover the whole uh, entire moon. So the black spots or the dark spots on the moon are in fact not uh, continents, uh, but instead uh, it's known as the Maria. And the Maria is Latin for sea. And what these Maria represent are these basalt flows. And if you recall uh, what a basalt is, it's a mafic type uh, extrusive igneous rock that's high in iron and magnesium. And it's a very dark colored rock. To, it's a volcanic type rock. In fact, it's the most common volcanic rock on earth. But really what the Maria represents on the moon are these basins uh, that filled up uh, with these basaltic lava flows that emanated uh, from volcanism during the moon's uh, formation. And so really they're very smooth type surfaces. And if you were on the moon, you'd be able to walk along their flat surfaces. And again, you can kind of look at the picture and you can kind of see where they're circular, uh, meaning they probably filled up a lot of crater uh, type areas. So this is pronounced as Maria and not Maria. The lighter portion of the moon um, is represented by what we call highlands. And the highlands um, are basically craters. And this is where the moon has been pelted over time with abundant, abundant amount of um, crater or uh, um, meteorites and asteroids and different kinds of materials basically slammed into the moon, uh, creating the craters or creating the highlands. And what's significant about the highlands is compositionally, the highlands are composed of the uh, extrusive uh, igneous rock uh, obsidian. And we know that obsidian is a pretty glassy type extrusive igneous rock. And so that really allows the, the moon to be illuminated and reflect uh, when the sun uh, radiates and, and shines off of it. So we've got the Maria, the salt flows, and then we got the craters uh, represented by the uh, highlands. So we're gonna talk a little bit now about the phases of the moon. And in this particular uh, animation uh, that you're looking at on your screen, it's really showing uh, the illumination and the dark side or the dark parts of the moon uh, through a 29-day period. And so it's showing 29 days in about uh, two seconds. And it's showing all the seven major phases of the moon, which take place in a period of one month. And, and it takes the uh, moon uh, just about 29 days to get around the Earth once. So let me repeat that because we're going to kind of use this uh, to start describing uh, why we see various moon phases. So the orbital moon period around the Earth is 29 days. So it takes the moon almost a full month just to get around the Earth once, which means what? Is the Earth spinning faster than the moon or slower than the moon? In this case, I'm hoping you're saying that the Earth is spinning faster than the moon. And again, we're going to use that spinning that Earth, spinning Earth fast, fast spinning Earth, a relationship to the slow uh, moon around the Earth in one month. So this picture now shows um, the various phases of the moon that we experience um, over a 29-day period. And so if I use my arrow here, uh, the first thing uh, that one typically does to start describing the phases of the moon is to identify uh, where the sunlight is coming in. So these yellow uh, arrows here indicate the sun's radiation. And so by convention, uh, we'll start with the first phase in which the uh, moon um, is facing the sun as well as the earth is facing the sun. So here's the sunlight coming in. It's illuminating this half of the part of the moon here. It's illuminating this half of the Earth here. And if we use uh, North America or Bakersfield, for example, for our reference point, 
Bakersfield would be right here. And so on the first phase, or what we call the new moon phase, or day zero, if you're looking at the moon from Bakersfield, what are you seeing? And you probably will not see anything because the dark side of the moon is facing um, the light part of the Earth. So the new moon is typically described um, as uh, not being able to see it. So now let's allow, because we know the Earth is spinning faster than what the moon goes around. And the Earth is spinning faster um, with respect to how long it takes the moon to go around the uh, Earth once. So the moon's or the Earth is going to spin around four days. One, two, three, four. In those four days, the moon now will only move to this position right here. And moving upon that position and living in Bakersfield, we can look at it from this direction. And now we start to see the illumination of the moon begin to show. And the, this phase is called the waxing crescent phase. And the term waxing is used uh, for the term increase. And when we say waxing, we're saying the illumination of the moon is increasing. So it starts in this waxing phase or its increase illumination phase. Then we go another uh, three or four days and now the moon moves into this position. And uh, again, we're from Bakersfield, we're looking at it from this point of view. And now the moon is half showing and you can see where the illumination has gotten greater. This is known as the first quarter phase. We'll move another three or four days and the moon now uh, moves into what we call the waxing gibbous phase. And the waxing gibbous phase is probably one of my favorite phases because it really resembles the shape of a lemon. And so when you're in the waxing gibbous, it's in the shape of a lemon. And then by day 14, so we've gone 14 days into the month, and now the moon has moved halfway around the Earth, and now we're in the full moon phase. And so you can certainly see now the sunlight's coming in, it's lighting up this part of the Earth, and then it lights up this part of the moon, full moon. And then by day 18, um, we have now moved into what we call the waning gibbous, and the term waning is described as decreasing. So waxing is increasing, waning now represents a decreasing illumination. By day 22, we're in the last quarter phase. And then by day 26, we're in the waning crescent phase. So the illumination now is going away. And then by day 29, we return back to the new moon phase. So here's the question. You're walking outside with your significant other and you both look up in the sky and you see the moon in one of its phases. And your significant other says to you, wow, is that moon waxing or is it in its waning phase? And now you're sweating, you've got to make a decision. Uh, you want to impress your significant other. So by looking at this map and looking at the illumination, how can you tell or one decipher the difference between a waxing phase versus a waning phase. So I'll let you look at it for just about 10 seconds. So upon observing the illumination, hopefully you figured out that if the bright side of the moon is on the right side, then it is in a waxing phase. Let me repeat that. If the bright part of the moon is on its right side, like you see in the waxing, the first, and the waxing gibbous phases, then we would say the moon's illumination is increasing. And then if the bright side of the moon or the illuminated side is on the left side, then you would say, wow, being on the left side, then the uh, moon is in its waning phase. So waxing is the right side illumination, waning is the left side illumination. So your homework tonight is to actually take your significant other for a walk in the nice uh, warmer weather. Look up in the sky and explain to your significant other that the moon is either waxing or waning depending on uh, where the brightness is or what side it's on. So this next uh, animated slide here 
uh, shows uh, the moon uh, moving around the earth in 29 days. And it shows um, on this side, on the left side of the screen, it shows, uh, again, the moon moving around the earth. The right side of the screen uh, shows the moon in different phases and what you would uh, observe. So there's the new moon, waxing crescent, first quarter, waxing gibbous, full moon, waning gibbous, last quarter, waning crescent. So we'll kind of go through this more, a couple more times and I'll kind of let you watch it. So we'll start right here with the new moon. Full moon and back to the new moon. So now you are armed with education, with knowledge, and uh, you should be able to impress your significant other on that walk. So let's kind of shift gears a little bit and look at the eclipses of the moon. And two in particular that we're gonna look at is the lunar eclipse and the solar eclipse. And I think the focus here in terms of learning the difference is to learn the geometry learn the uh, the uh, interstellar uh, geometry of what produces a lunar and a solar eclipse. So the first one we're going to look at is the lunar um, eclipse. And there are several ways uh, to, to learn this. Um, I think the way I think is the easiest way is instead of trying to learn uh, where each one of the uh, uh, sun, earth, and moon are, it's better to ask this question which uh, which um, celestial object is casting the, the, the shadow on the other object. So in terms of the lunar eclipse, we would say that the Earth is casting the shadow on the moon. And if you look at the geometry then that would that would make that work is the sun is here, the Earth is in between the sun and the moon, and the Earth has to be there in between to be able to cast the shadow. So in this diagram then, uh, you see where the moon now is moving uh, into the shadow um, of the earth. There's a couple important terms uh, that are necessary to describe the shadow. Uh, the first term is called the penumbra, which is right here. The penumbra represents the outer part of the shadow, which is probably just a little bit lighter uh, because light bends. So the penumbra is the outer part of the shadow. And then the umbra is the darker part of the shadow. And so as you can see then, as the moon uh, moves into the shadow of the earth, it first enters the penumbra and then enters the umbra. It stays in the umbra for a while because we know that the earth is larger than the moon. And then it moves out of the shadow, back into the penumbra, and then uh, back out of the shadow. And so again, the lunar eclipse is where the Earth casts the shadow on the moon. And geometrically, we would say that the Earth is in between the sun and the moon. So this next um, uh, slide just kind of shows you an animation of what a lunar eclipse would look like. So again, you can see the moon going into penumbra, umbra, and penumbra again. So let's kind of watch it here again. So there's the moves into the penumbra, umbra, and then the penumbra. Okay, I think on the next uh, couple slides, I'm actually going to show you some pictures of what the moon looks like as it's moving, uh, you know, uh, into the penumbra and the umbra and the back into the penumbra. And so your job is to kind of look at the moon and see when you can predict when it is in fact in the penumbra, umbra, penumbra. So there's probably the umbra and there's the penumbra. So let's see if we can see that again. So there's the penumbra. Now it's fully into the shadow, umbra, and then out of the penumbra. And typically, at least uh, most of the lunar eclipses that I've ever experienced and watched and looked at, uh, the moon gets uh, very brilliantly uh, kind of a reddish kind of moon. It's actually very spectacular. So now let's look at the solar um, eclipse. And again, um, who's casting the shadow on who in this case? So again, to review the lunar eclipse, the Earth casts the shadow. 
in the solar eclipse, the moon casts the shadow. And so if the moon is half, if the moon is going to cast the shadow, then the moon is going to be in between both the sun and the earth. And so here you can see where the moon is situated again between sun and earth. The moon is casting its shadow on the earth. You have the penumbra here. You have a smaller umbra here. And then you have a penumbra here where my arrow is showing. And so here's an animation of a, a solar eclipse. And we'll watch this. And there's the moon sweeping across the earth, dragging its shadow. And you can kind of guess um, where most of the time the shadow is being cast on earth. And that is the fact that the earth is covered with 70% oceans that commonly and most times the shadow um, is dragged across the ocean. And occasionally, of course, it will be dragged across the continent, which I believe happened, I think it was last year, where the uh, umbra of the moon during the solar eclipse uh, started in uh, Oregon and went clear across the United States and, and came out in the East Coast. So we'll watch it one more time here. Then I'll have some pictures of a solar eclipse. Okay. So here's um, a solar eclipse taking place. And um, I believe a satellite probably took this picture. And uh, see if you can pick out the umbra and the penumbra. Hopefully you put the umbra about right there. And I got the penumbra right there. Um, here's another picture. It looks like um, a solar eclipse uh, taking place across the African continent. So see if you can pick out the umbra and the penumbra. Umbra, penumbra. Well, one of the interesting um, characteristics that take place uh, during a um, solar eclipse is looking at a, what we call the total eclipse of the sun. And folks uh, pay uh, many, many high dollars to be able to um, take pictures of a total uh, eclipse of the sun, which means that you have to be right in the umbra. And typically a total solar eclipse will last just for less than a minute because the um, basically the uh, moon is geometrically gets right in between the earth and the sun and the moon exactly covers up the sun and allows a huge flash to take place where folks get to experience and look at the corona or the very outside uh, atmosphere part of the sun. And so this picture here is showing you a total uh, eclipse of the sun. Isn't that the name of a song? This picture here is a still picture and it shows you if you were able to ever uh, experience and look at a total solar eclipse. Um, this is something you might observe. And so here uh, you can see where the uh, moon is completely covering the sun. And then you can see the very outsides. And this is the corona part of the sun uh, showing you uh, the gases and flares and whatnot coming off of the sun. Pretty spectacular. This um, picture is probably more common to more folks uh, during a uh, solar um, eclipse. And this is what we call a partial um, eclipse, and which means that most folks will look at a, um, a solar um, eclipse and not be quite in the umbra. So the path of the moon almost covers up um, the entire um, sun, but just a, doesn't quite make it and it leaves a little bit of the sun shining. And though here would be some, here would be an example of a partial solar eclipse right here. And so you can kind of see uh, where the uh, moon is moving in the path of the sun, but it's not quite covering it up. So this would be regarded as a partial solar eclipse. And just to go on record, if you ever are to observe a, a solar eclipse, you certainly, A, don't want to just stare at it. You want to protect your eyes. Uh, regular sunglasses uh, aren't going to work as well, so don't use regular sunglasses. Uh, what pe folk, most folks recommend is a piece of welding glass. A piece of welding glass works really well. Um, you you know, um, when there is going to be a solar eclipse, uh, you're, uh, sometimes you're able to buy an actual pair of glasses 
that will allow you to watch uh, the solar eclipse. I know that last year uh, when the solar eclipse went across the United States, of course, I was very excited about it. And so I had a pair of those glasses. And of course, from California, we're only seeing a partial eclipse. But it was really spectacular to put those glasses on and watch it. And I was sitting out in the, um, oh, the little park area by the uh, science building. And and a couple of faculty members brought their students out to look at it. And they were all using little pieces of paper and um, other little kind of stuff to watch it. And so I loaned my glasses out uh, to a couple of students so they can see it. And once I loaned the glasses out, other people started borrowing them. And then within about five minutes, I never got my glasses back. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. But anyway, this picture here shows a partial solar eclipse. This last picture in terms of um, solar eclipses is a cruise ship in which folks pay a lot of money to get on a cruise ship, for example, and to navigate that cruise ship into the Umbra. And so this is a picture of a solar eclipse um, uh, um, in which this um, cruise ship is inside the Umbra. And what's interesting is you can see it's dark here and then on the outskirts, it's very light. If you ever do get a chance to um, experience a solar eclipse and to be in the Umbra, it's, it's quite spectacular. Uh, when I was going to um, college back at San Diego State University back in the 80s, uh, there was a solar uh, eclipse and a part of the Umbra went right over San Diego. And I remember um, it was probably about, I don't know, one or two in the afternoon and it got really dark. And it was a, one of the most eeriest um, feelings that one can ever get. In fact, some, even some of the flowers uh, started to close up thinking it was a dark time already. And it was very eerie. And it brought a thought to my mind. And that is, you know, folks uh, back in the beginning of civilization who really didn't understand the, this uh, display of celestial geometry uh, didn't really understand it. And can you imagine what they have thought if when they s experienced the shadow of the moon uh, going over the face of the earth and they get caught up in it and, and, and get in the middle of it? I mean, I can imagine folks probably thought the world was coming to an end to be able to you know see that umbra. But today in 2020, we're, um, we're well-educated. And so now it's basically a spectacular uh, site and again, it's probably one of the most um, most spectacular displays of celestial geometry uh, that I can never ever uh, experience.